Chapter Forty Four of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Forty Four. Scarcely had I entered my apartments at the Hotel de Soissons ere I received a visit from Signor Vanoni, who informed me that the Countess was somewhat offended at my having gone forth without rendering her my first visit of ceremony she invites you however added the old man to be present to-night in the observatory of catherine de medici's which you have doubtless remarked from your window while i endeavour to satisfy her as far as my poor abilities go in regard to the future fate of her son which she imagines may be learned from the stars and do you not hold the same opinion demanded i seeing that vanoni had some hesitation in admitting his own belief in astrological science i suppose there are at least as many who give full credit to the pretensions of astrologers as there are who doubt their powers my own opinion replied the old man signifies little i certainly must have thought there was some truth in a science before i made it a profound study which i have done in regard to astrology however if you will do me the honour of following me i will show you the interior of the magnificent column which catherine de medicis constructed for the purpose of consulting those stars which are now he added with a smile growing as much out of fashion as her own farthingale i followed him accordingly and crossing the gardens at the end of one of the alleys came upon that immense stone tower in the form of a column which may be seen to the present day standing behind the hotel des fermes it was night but beautifully clear and starlight and looking up i could see the tall dark head of that immense pillar rising like a black giant high above all the buildings around and i felt that much of the credence which astrologers themselves placed in their own dreams might well be ascribed to the influence of the solemn and majestic scenes in which their studies were carried on i understood completely how a man of an ardent imagination placed on an eminence like that far above a dull and drowsy world below with nothing around him but silence and no contemplation but the bright and beautiful stars might dream grand dreams and fancy that in the golden lettered books before his eyes he could read the secret tale of fate and discover the immutable decrees of destiny i did more i felt that were i long there myself i should become a dreamer too and give rein to imagination as foolishly as any one we now entered the tower by a strong door at which were stationed two small negro pages each of whom dressed in the oriental costume bore a silver lamp burning with some sort of spirit which gave a blue unearthly sort of light to whatever they approached notwithstanding my own tendency towards imaginativeness perhaps i might say towards superstition i could not help smiling to see with what pains people who wish to give way to their fancy add every accessory which may tend to deceive themselves anything strange unusual or mysterious is of great assistance to the imagination and the sight of the two small negroes with their large rolling eyes and singular dress together with the purple gleam of the lamps in the gloomy interior of the tower were all well calculated to impress the mind with those vague sort of sensations which themselves partaking of the wild and extraordinary form a good preparation to ideas and feelings not quite tangible to the calm research of reason vanoni saw me smile and as we went up the stairs of the tower he said that mummery is none of mine the good countess is resolved not to let her imagination halt for want of aid but the belief which i give to the science of astrology is founded upon a different principle the historical certainty that many of the most extraordinary predictions derived from the stars have been verified contrary to all existing probabilities a certainty as clearly demonstrable as any other fact of history and much more so than many things to which men give implicit credence in the search of truth we must take care to get rid of that worst of prejudices because the vainest 
that of believing nothing but what is within the mere scope of our own knowledge now it is as much a matter of history as that julius caesar once lived in rome that in this very tower an astrologer predicted to catherine de medicis the exact number of years which each of her descendants should reign it has been one cause of the disrepute into which the science of astrology has fallen he added that its professors mingled a degree of charlatanism with their predictions which they intended to give them authority but which has ultimately discredited the art itself thus the astrologer i speak of not contented with predicting what he knew would happen and leaving the rest to fate must needs show to the queen the images of her sons in what he pretended to be a magic glass and by this sort of juggle diminished his own credit though the procès verbal of what catherine saw taken down at the time is now in the hands of the countess de soissons may i ask the particulars said i growing somewhat interested in the subject and also whether this procès verbal is undoubtedly authentic beyond all question replied the old man leading the way into a circular hall at the very top of the tower it has descended from hand to hand direct so that no doubt of its being genuine can possibly exist what the queen saw was as follows being placed opposite a mirror in this very chamber after various fantastic ceremonies unworthy of man of real science the astrologer called upon the genius of francis the second to appear and make as many turns round the chamber as he should reign years instantly catherine beheld a figure exactly resembling her son appear in the glass before her and with a slow and mournful step take one turn round the chamber and begin another but before it was much more than half completed he disappeared suddenly and another figure succeeded in which she instantly recognised her second son afterwards charles the ninth he encircled the hall fourteen times with a quick and irregular pace after him came henry the third who nearly completed fifteen circles when suddenly another figure supposed to be that of the duke of guise came suddenly before him and both disappearing together left the hall void seemingly intimating to the queen that there her posterity should end there stands the mirror he added but its powers are gone i approached the large ancient mirror with its carved ebony frame to which he pointed and looked into it for a moment my mind glancing back to the days of catherine de medicis and her gay and vicious court and binding the present to the past with that fine vague line of associations whose thrilling vibrations form as it were the music of memory when suddenly as if the old magician still exercised his power upon his own mirror the stately form of a lady dressed in long robes of black velvet rose up before me in the glass and with a start which showed how much my imagination was already excited i turned round and beheld the countess de soissons without waiting for the reprimand which i doubted not she intended to bestow upon me i apologised for having been rude enough to go anywhere without first having paid my respects to herself alleging business of an important nature as my excuse and pray what important business can have such a great man as yourself have in our poor capital demanded the countess with a look of haughty scorn that had well nigh put to flight my whole provision of politeness i believe madam replied i after a moment's pause that monsieur le comte your son informed you by a note which i delivered that i had come to paris on affairs which he thought fit to entrust to me and a pretty personage he chose interrupted the countess but i come not here to hear your excuses youth has signor vanoni told you the important purpose for which i commanded you to meet me here i replied that he had not done so fully and she proceeded to inform me that the learned italian having been furnished by her with all the astrological particulars of my birth which she had obtained from my mother many years before and also having received those of the birth of her own son the count de soissons he had chosen that evening for the purpose of consulting the stars concerning our future fate it is needless to go through all the proceedings of the astrologer 
his prediction being the only interesting part of the ceremony this he delivered without any affectation or mummery as the mere effect of calculations and his very plainness had something in it much more convincing than any assumption of mystery for it left me convinced of his own sincere belief in what he stated i forget the precise terms of his prophecy in regard to the count de soissons suffice it that it was such as left room for an easy construction to be put upon it shuddering out what was really the after-fate of a prince to whom it related in regard to myself he informed me that dangers and difficulties awaited me more fearful and more painful than any i had hitherto encountered but that with fortitude i should surmount them all and he added that if i still lived after one month from that day my future fate looked clear and smiling all who sought my life he said father should die by my hand or fail in their attempt and that in marriage i should meet both wealth and rank and beauty absurd as i knew the whole system to be yet i own man's weaknesses form perhaps the most instructive part of his history and therefore it is i say it absurd as i knew the whole system to be yet i could not help pondering over this latter part of his prediction and endeavoured to reconcile it in my own mind to the probabilities of the future my helen had beauty i knew too well wealth i had heard attributed to her and rank the prince had promised to obtain o oh, man man thou art a strange weak being and thy boasted reason is but a glorious vanity which serves thee little till thy passions have left thee and then conducts thee to a grave hope in my breast but a drowning swimmer clung to a straw to worse a bubble i followed the countess de soissons from the tower thoughtful and dreamy and i believe the old man vanoni was somewhat pleased to witness the effect that his words had wrought upon me though he could little see the strange and mingled web that fancy and reason were weaving in my breast the golden threads of the one though looking as light as a gossamer proving fully strong enough to cross the woof of the other and outshine it in the light of hope at the foot of the staircase we found the countess's women waiting and having suffered me to conduct her to the door of the hotel de soissons she gave me my dismissal with the same air of insufferable haughtiness and retired into the house as my apartments lay in one of the wings i was again crossing the garden to reach them when suddenly a figure glided past me which for a moment rooted me to the ground it was in vain i accused myself of superstition of madness of folly the belief still remained fixed upon my mind that i had seen jean baptiste arnault whom i had shot with my own hand the moon had just risen the space before me was clear and if ever my eyes served me in the world it was the figure of him i had killed that passed before me without loss of time i made my way to my own apartments and pale haggard and agitated i cast myself in a seat while little achilles in no small surprise gazed on me with open eyes and asked a thousand times what he could do for me it was he muttered i without taking any notice of the little man it was certainly jean baptiste arnault if ever i beheld him my brother exclaimed achilles i thought he was at lourdes with that most respectable gentleman his father my mother's husband that was and my parent that ought to have been i certainly thought he was at lourdes he is in the grave and by my hand replied i scarcely understanding what he had said but gradually as i grew calm my mind took in his meaning and i exclaimed your brother was jean baptiste arnault your brother that he certainly was by my mother's side replied the little player and as good a soul he was when a boy as ever existed an explanation of course ensued and on calling to mind the little man's history i found that no great wit would have been necessary to have understood his connection with arnault before a more painful narrative followed on my part 
for Achilles pressed me upon the words I had let fall. I could not tell him the circumstances of his brother's death. That would have been too dreadful for my state of mind at the moment. But I assured him that it had been accidental, and I told him the regret, the horror, the grief which it had occasioned me ever since. Poor Jean-Baptiste, cried the little player, with more feeling than I thought he possessed. He was as good a creature as ever lived, and now when I hear that he is dead, all his tricks of boyhood, and all the happy hours when we played together, come up upon my mind, and I feel, what well, perhaps I never felt rightly before, what a sad thing it is to be an outcast, denied and forgotten, and alone, without one tie of kindred between me and the wide world. And the tears came up into his eyes as he spoke. Do not let me vex you, monsieur, continued he. I am sure you would harm no one on purpose, and you have been to me far better than kind and kindred. For you alone, on all the earth, have borne with me, and shown me unfailing kindness. But yet I cannot help regretting poor Jean-Baptiste. It was a bitter and a painful theme, and we both dropped it as soon as it was possible. Ideas, however, were reawakened in my mind that defied sleep and though I persuaded myself that the figure I had seen was but the effect of an imagination overexcited by what had passed during the day, and the thoughts that had lately occupied me, yet, as I lay in my bed, all the horrid memories over which time had begun to exercise some softening power, came up as sharp and fresh as if the blood was still flowing that my hand had shed. I rose late, and while Achilles was aiding me to dress, I saw that there was something on his mind that he wished to say. At length it broke forth. I would not for the world speak to you, monsieur, on a subject that is so painful, said the little player, with a delicacy of which I had hardly judged him capable. But this morning something extraordinary has happened, and I think it best to tell you. As I was standing but now at the gate of the Hôtel de Soissons, who should pass by but arnaud the old procureur he stopped suddenly and looked at me and as i thought he knew me though in all probability i was mistaken i spoke to him and we had a long conversation me he seemed to care very little about but he asked me a world of questions about you and he seemed to know all that you were doing a great deal better than i did myself I assured him, however, that the death of poor Jean-Baptiste was entirely accidental, as you told me, and I related to him all that you had suffered on that account, and how often, even now, it would make you as grave and as melancholy as if it were just done. I wanted him very much to tell me where he lived, but he would not, and took himself off directly I asked the question. It gave me some pain to hear that Achilles had now positively informed Arnaud that my hand had slain his son. Helen could never be mine. I felt it but too bitterly, as the dreams which the astrologer's predictions had suggested died away in my bosom. And yet I shrank from the idea of her knowing that he whom she had loved was the murderer of her brother. I could not, however, blame Achilles for what he had done, the name of helen had never been mentioned between us and when i thought that she was his sister the sister of my own servant though it changed no feeling in my breast towards her though it left her individually lovely and excellent and graceful as ever in my eyes yet it gave new strength to the vow i had made to obey my mother's last injunctions by adding to the objections which she would have had to that alliance the conviction that we were fated never to be united took firm possession of my mind destiny seemed willing to spare me even the pain of faint hopes by piling up obstacle on obstacle between us but i resolved that if i might never call her i loved my own i would give the place which she had filled in my heart to no other i would live solitary and unbound by those ties which she alone could have rendered delightful i would pass through life without the touch of kindred or of wedded love and go down to the grave the last of my race and name such were my resolutions 
and variable and light as my character was in some degree i believe that i should have kept them i notwithstanding the quick and ardent blood of youth and my own proneness to passion and excitement in the course of the morning i visited m de retz and according to the commands of m le comte we mutually communicated the steps we had taken though i believe de retz informed me of the success which had attended his negotiations more to force me into a return of confidence than for any other reason from the letter which m de Cramal slipped into my hand yesterday said he as well as from what he told me viva voce i can now safely say the bastille is our own indeed it is wonderful with what facility this party of prisoners dispose of their place of confinement but the count tells me here that he has won the officers of the garrison and the officers have won the soldiers that in short all hearts are for monsieur le comte and that it only wants a first success to make all hands for him too oh my dear de Lorme, he burst forth what a wonderful thing is that same word success but once attach it to a man's name and you shall have all the world kneel to serve him and lord him to the skies let him but fail and the whole pack will be upon him like a herd of hungry wolves give me the man that while success is doubtful stands my friend who views my action and my worth by their own intrinsic merit and pins not his faith upon that great impostor success whose favour or whose frown depends not on ourselves but circumstance as soon as it was dusk i went alone to my little lodging in the rue des prets saint paul and after waiting for about half an hour received the visit of my two most respectable followers combalet and jacques moqueur as they entered i saw by a certain smirking air of satisfaction on their countenances that they had been successful in their negotiation which they soon informed me was the case we have permission from his most accumulated majesty of the huns said jacques moqueur to introduce monsieur le comte de Lorme into his famous palace called chateau escroc and to naturalize him a hun upon the reasonable condition of his submitting to be blindfolded as he is conducted through the various passes of the country of the huns in regard to being blindfolded replied i i have not the least objection as it is but natural you should take means to prevent your secret resorts from being betrayed but i must first understand clearly what you mean by my being naturalized a hun before i submit to any such proceeding it is a most august and solemn proceeding replied combalet de carignan and many of the first nobility have submitted to it without blushing his infirmity his infirmity cried jacques Moqueur i pray your lordship would not forget his infirmity not a noble in these or former times ever thought of submitting to the ceremony but yourself but after all it is but a ceremony which binds you to nothing if that be the case replied i i will go but be so good as to remark that i have nothing upon my person but the ten gold pieces which i have promised your worthy monarch and i beg that you will give notice thereof to the worthy corporation i am going to meet lest the devil of cupidity should tempt them to play me foul for that we are your lordship's surety said combalet i should like to see the man who would wag a finger against you while we stood by your side your lordship does us injustice said jacques moqueur in a less swaggering tone there is honour even to a proverb amongst the gentlemen you are going to meet but if you are at all afraid one of us will stay till your return at the hotel de soissons where our friend the archer informed us you really lodged i am not in the least afraid replied i but i spoke knowing that human nature is fallible and that the idea of gold might raise up an evil spirit amongst some of your companions which even you might find it difficult to lay however lead on i will follow you i question much whether the council has yet met replied combalet but we shall be some time in going and therefore we may as well depart we accordingly proceeded into the street where i went on first followed scarcely a step behind by my two bravos in the manner of a gentleman going on some visit accompanied by his lackeys 
at every corner of each street either combalet or his companion whispered to me the turning i was to take and thus we proceeded for near half an hour till i became involved in lanes and buildings with which i was totally unacquainted notwithstanding my manifold melancholy rambling through paris when i was there alone and tormented with gloomy thoughts that drove me forth continually for mere occupation the houses seemed to grow taller and closer together and in many of the lanes through which we passed i could have touched each side of the street by merely stretching out my hands darkness too reigned supreme so that it was with difficulty that i saw my way forward and certainly should often not have known that there was any turning near had it not been for the whisper of my companions to the right or to the left the way was long too and tortuous winding in and out with a thousand labyrinthine turnings as if it had been built on purpose to conceal every kind of vice and crime and wretchedness amongst its obscure involutions every now and then from the houses as i passed burst forth the sound of human voices sometimes in low murmurs sometimes in loud and boisterous merriment and sometimes even in screams and cries of enmity or pain that made my blood run cold still however i pursued my purpose i could but lose my life and life to me had not that value which it possesses with the happy and the prosperous i would have sold it dear nevertheless and was well prepared to do so for i was armed with dagger sword and pistol so that setting the object to be gained by murdering me which could but be my clothes with the risk and bloodshed of the attempt i judged myself very secure though i found clearly that i was plunging deeper and deeper every moment among those sinks of vice iniquity and horror with which some part of every great city is sure to be contaminated suddenly as i was proceeding along one of these narrow streets a hand was laid firmly but not rudely on my breast and a voice asked where go you jacques moncoeur stepped forward instantly and whispering a word to my interrogator i was suffered to proceed in a few minutes after we arrived at a passage where my bravos informed me that it would be necessary to bandage my eyes which was soon done and being conducted forward i perceived that we went into a house the entrance of which was so narrow that it was with difficulty combalet could turn sufficiently to lead me onward by the hand i took care as we went to count the number of paces and to mark well the turnings so that i believe i could have retraced my steps had it been necessary after turning four times we once more emerged into the open air as if we crossed an inner court and i could hear a buzz of many voices seemingly from some window above we now again entered a house and having turned twice the bravos halted and i heard an old woman's voice cry in a ragged broken tone they are waiting for you you two lazy jessamine flinchers and what new devil have you brought with you a pretty piece of flesh i declare why he has a leg and an arm like the man of bronze while these observations were being made upon my person my two worthy retainers were detaching the bandage from my eyes and as soon as i could see i found myself standing in a large vestibule at the foot of a staircase an iron lamp hung from the ceiling and by its light i beheld a hideous old woman in that horrid state where mental imbecility seemed treading on the heels of every sort of vice her high aquiline nose her large bleared dull eyes swimming between drunkenness and folly her wide mouth the lips of which had long since fallen in over her toothless gums all offered now a picture of the most degrading ugliness while with a kind of gloating gaze she examined me from head to foot crying from time to time a pretty piece of flesh ay a pretty piece of flesh nice devil's food will you give me a kiss young beelzebub and throwing her arms suddenly round me she gave me a hug that froze the very blood in my veins i threw her from me with disgust and in her state of semi-drunkenness she tottered back and fell upon the pavement giving a great scream 
on which a man who had been lying in a corner totally unseen by me sprang up and drawing his sword rushed upon me crying morbleu marot how dare you strike mother marinette it was a critical moment to do anything with the wild and lawless it needs to show one's self as fierce and fearless as themselves my sword was out in an instant and knowing that sometimes a display of daring courage with men like those amongst whom i was placed will touch the only feelings that remain in their seared and blackened hearts and do no more with them than any other earthly quality i cried out to my two retainers who were hurrying to separate us let him alone let him alone we are man to man i only ask fair play fair play give him fair play cried combalet and his companion to half a dozen ruffians that came rushing down the stairs at the noise give the count fair play it's a quarrel about a lady cried jacques Moncoeur. an affair of honour a duello let no one interrupt them in the meanwhile my antagonist lunged at me with vain fury he was not unskilled in the use of his weapon but his was what may be called bravo fencing very well calculated for street brawls where five or six persons are engaged together but not fit to be opposed to a really good swordsman calmly hand to hand his traverses were loose and he bore hard against my blade so that at last suddenly shifting my point i deceived him with a half time and not willing exactly to kill him brought him down with a severe wound in his shoulder quarter for goguenard quarter for goguenard cried the respectable spectators several of whom had during the combat served me essentially by withholding madame marinette the belle dame whose caresses i had repulsed so unceremoniously from exercising her talons upon my face my sword was instantly sheathed and my antagonist being raised looked at me with a grim grin but without any apparent malice you've sliced my bacon cried he but ventre saint gris you are a tight hand and i forgive you the wounded man was now carried off to have his wound puttied as he expressed it and i was then ushered upstairs into a large room wherein all the swashbucklers that the noise of clashing swords had brought out like a swarm of wasps when their nest is disturbed now hastened to take their seats round a large table that occupied the centre of the hall in place of the pens the inkhorns and the paper which grace the more dignified council boards of more modern nations that of the worthy huns was only covered in imitation of their ancestors with swords and pistols daggers and knives bottles glasses and flagons symbolical of the spirit in which their laws were conceived and the sharpness with which they were enforced at the head of the table when we entered were seated four or five of the sager members of the council who had not suffered their attention to be called from their deliberations like the rest and in a great armchair raised above the rest was placed a small old man with sharp grey eyes a keen pinched nose and a look of the most infallible cunning i ever beheld in mortal countenance he wore his hat buttoned with a large jewel and was very splendidly attired in black velvet so that from every circumstance of his appearance i was inclined to believe i beheld in him that very powerful and politic monarch called the king of the huns as combalet de carignan and jacques moncoeur were leading me forward in state to present me to the monarch he rose and stroking his short grey beard from the root to the point between his finger and thumb he demanded with an air of dignity what noise was that i heard but now and who dared to draw a sword within the precincts of our royal palace this question was answered by jacques moncoeur with the following delectable sentence may it please your majesty the case was that old marinette did the sweet upon the count here who buffed her a swagger that earthed her marrow-bones whereupon mutton-faced goguenard aired his pinking iron upon the count and would have made his chanter gape if the count had not sliced his bacon and brought him to kiss his mother this explanation however unintelligible to me at the time seemed perfectly satisfactory to the great potentate to whom it was addressed 
who nodding to me with a gracious inclination replied the count most justly punished an aggression upon the person of an ambassador let our secretary propose the oaths to the count our cup-bearer bring forward our solemn goblet and let the worthy nobleman take the oaths and be naturalized a true and faithful hun a meagre gentleman in a black suit now advanced towards me with a book in his hand and proposed to me to swear that i would be thenceforward a true and faithful subject to the mighty monarch francois saint maur king of the huns that i would act as a true and loyal hun in all things but especially in submitting myself to all the laws of the commonwealth and the ordinances of the king in council as well as in keeping inviolably secret all the proceedings of the huns their places of resort their private signs signals designs plans plots and communications with a great variety of other particulars all couched in fine technical language which took nearly a quarter of an hour in repeating greater part of this oath i took the liberty of rejecting giving so far in to their mockery of ceremony as to state my reasons to the monarch with an affectation of respect that seemed to please him not a little and though one or two of the ruffians thought fit to grumble at any concessions being made to me it was nevertheless arranged that the oath should be curtailed in my favour to a solemn vow of secrecy which i willingly took an immense wrought goblet of silver was now presented to me which i should have imagined to be a chalice filched from some church had it not been for various figures of bacchanals and satyrs richly embossed on the stalk and base i raised it to my lips drinking to the monarch of the huns who received my salutation standing but the very first mouthful showed me that it was filled with ardent spirits and returning it to the cup-bearer i begged that i might be accommodated with wine for that there was quite enough in the cup to incapacitate me for fulfilling the important mission with which i was charged a loud shout at my flinching from the cup was the first reply and one of the respectable cut-throats exclaimed from the other side of the table give some milk and water to the chicken-hearted demoiselle i had already had enough of brawling for the night and as no farther object was to be gained by noticing the ruffian's insult at the time i took the cup that was now presented to me filled with wine and drank health to the king of the huns without seeming to hear what had been said the most delicate part of my mission still remained to be fulfilled namely to explain to the chief of all the thieves swindlers and bravos in paris for such was the king of the huns the objects of the count de soissons without putting his name and reputation in the power of every ruffian in the capital and as i looked round the room which was now crowded with men of every attire and every carriage i found a thousand additional reasons in every villainous countenance for being as guarded and circumspect as possible how i should have acquitted myself heaven only knows but a great deal of trouble was taken off my hands by the king of the huns himself who after regarding me for a moment with his little grey eyes that seemed to enter into one's very heart and pry about in every secret corner thereof opened the business himself and left my father conduct comparatively easy count de lorme said he in a loud voice while all the rest kept silence you have sought an interview with us and you have gained it ordinary politicians would now use all their art to conceal what they know of your purpose and to make you unfold to them more perhaps than you wished but we with the frankness that characterizes a great nation are willing to show you that we are already aware of much more than you imagine you sent word to us that you came on a mission from a prince we will save you the trouble of naming him he is louis de bourbon count de soissons a murmur of surprise at the penetration of the king ran through the assembly but to me his means of information on this point were evident enough the archer had communicated to the bravos that though i received them in the rue Prat saint paul i lodged myself at the hotel de soissons they had informed their chief of the same and by an easy chain of conclusions he had fallen upon the right person as my principal how he came by the rest of his information i do not know but he proceeded 
his highness the count de soissons is universally loved in the same proportion as the minister his enemy is hated and there is not one man amongst my subjects who does not bear the greatest affection to the one and the greatest abhorrence towards the other a loud shout of assent interrupted him for a moment but when it had subsided he went on the count is we are well informed preparing on all hands for open war with the cardinal and we also know that there is more than one agent working privately in this city for his service we are not amongst those who will be most backward or most inefficient in his cause and we only wish to know in the first instance what he expects of us not that i mean to say he added that we do not intend therein to have some eye to our own interests yet nevertheless the count will not find us hard or difficult to deal with as our enemies would have men believe in answer to this speech i went directly to the point finding that all diplomatizing on the subject was spared me i therefore told the king of the huns that he was perfectly right in the view he had taken of the case and that as the count was now driven to extremity by the cardinal it was natural that he should take every means to strengthen his own cause of course under the circumstances i added he would not think of neglecting so large and respectable a body as the huns and had therefore sent me to pray them in case of a rising in the city of paris on his part to support his friends with all their aid and influence and to embarrass his enemies by all those means which no men knew so well how to employ as themselves i farther added that if under the permission and sanction of their government any of his majesty's subjects would enroll themselves as men-at-arms to serve the count de soissons under my command the prospect of vast advantages was before them but that of course i should require those men who having some knowledge of military discipline and habits would not need the long and tedious drilling of young recruits such we have amongst our subjects in plenty replied the king of the huns we are as i need not inform you essentially a military nation and for our own credit the troops we furnish to our well-beloved cousin monsieur le comte shall be of the best quality a murmuring conversation now took place through the assembly each man expressing to his neighbour his opinion of what had just passed in a low voice that left nothing audible but the various curses and imprecations with which they seasoned their discourse and which seasoning certainly predominated over the matter this left me however an opportunity of gaining some private speech of the king with whom in a very short time i contrived to settle all preliminaries i paid my ten louis to the treasury and promised twenty more in case of his showing himself active and serviceable in the rising of the metropolis he on his part engaged to select and send to a certain point on the frontiers as many horsemen as he could rely upon who were to take service with me and to bind themselves by oath to obey my commands for one month for the first month all i could promise in regard to pay was twenty crowns per man but this seemed quite satisfactory and i believed the plunder to be expected whichever party gained the day was much more tempting in their eyes than the ostensible reward the rendezvous was named at the little village of marigny beyond mouzon just over the frontier and it was agreed that the king should send me from time to time a note of the numbers he dispatched and that on my arrival at marigny i should disburse to each man his pay in advance on his taking the stipulated oath and showing himself ready for action armed with sword pistol dagger morion back and breast pieces and musketoon the number which his most hun-like majesty thought he could promise was about three hundred men and i very naturally supposed that i should have somewhat of a difficult command over men who had long submitted to no law but their own will i knew also that so trifling an incident as my having refused to pledge the king in his goblet of strong waters might do much harm to my future authority and therefore after having risen to go i ran my eye down the opposite side of the table and said in a loud voice some one about an hour ago called me a chicken-hearted demoiselle if he will stand out here in the free space i will give him the most convincing proof that my heart is as stout as his own and my hand not that of a girl 
a fellow with the form and countenance of an ox-slayer instantly started up but his companions thrust him down again several voices crying out no no down with him the count is no flincher look at goguenard the best man amongst us flawed like a sheep if any proof were wanting says jacques moqueur stepping forward to establish the noble count's slashing qualities i could give it i am known to be a tough morsel for any man's grinders and yet once upon a day the count did for two of us single-handed he sent captain von crack out of the window sack of wheat fashion and left me with the flesh of my arm gaping like an empty flagon this matter being settled i drank a parting cup with his majesty to the prosperity of the huns which was of course received with a loud shout and conducted by combelet de carignan and his companion i left chateau escroc with my whole frame fevered and burning from the excitement i had undergone i have only farther to remark that according to the oath of secrecy which i had taken i should not now have placed even this interview on paper had not that respectable body with whom i passed the evening been discovered some years since and totally routed out of all their dens the fraternity of the huns will doubtless ever exist in paris but thanks to the exertions of our late energetic criminal lieutenant they are now like the jews a dispersed and wandering people each depending on his own resources and turning the public to his own particular profit End of chapter 44chapter forty five of delorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty five during the ten days which followed i received every morning news of some new detachment having set out for marigny and each dispatch from the king of the huns gave me the most positive assurance of his co-operation in favour of the prince as soon as the signal should be given for the rising in paris de retz was enchanted with the progress i had made and declared with a sneer even at the enterprise in which he was himself engaged that now we possessed the poor the prisoners and the cutthroats our success in paris was certain amongst my researches he said one day while we were speaking over these circumstances i have met with the man that puzzles me he is certainly poor even to beggary at least so my scout who discovered him assures me and yet he refused pecuniary assistance though offered in the most delicate manner i could devise and repulsed me so haughtily that i could not introduce one word of treason or conspiracy into my discourse as you my dear count are about to venture yourself in mortal strife you could not have a more serviceable follower than this man's appearance bespeaks him he is a hercules and if his eye does not play the braggart in its owner's favour he is just a man to kill lions and strangle serpents you could not do better than visit him telling him that you are my friend and that i am most anxious to serve him if he will point me out the means i was very willing to follow the suggestion of monsieur de retz being at the very time engaged in searching for a certain number of personal attendants whose honesty might in some degree neutralize the opposite qualities of those that waited me at marigny having received the address then i proceeded to a small street in the cite and mounting three pair of stairs knocked at a door that had been indicated to me a deep voice bade me come in and entering a miserable apartment i beheld the object of my search the light was dim but there was something in the grand athletic limbs and proud erect carriage that made me start by their sudden call upon old recollections it was garcias himself whom i had left at barcelona borne high upon the top of that fluctuating billow popular favour that now stood before me in apparent poverty in paris he started forward and grasped my hand monsieur de l'orme cried he god of heaven then i am not quite abandoned his tale was not an extraordinary one he had fallen as he had risen the nobility of catalonia finding that the insurgents maintained themselves and received aid from france declared for the popular party gradually took possession of all authority and to secure it provided for the ruin of all those who had preceded him 
garcias was the most obnoxious because he had been the most powerful while the lower classes had predominated causes of accusation are never wanting in revolutions even against the best and noblest and garcias was obliged to fly to save himself from those whose liberties he had defended and saved spain was now all shut against him france was his only refuge and finding his way to paris he set himself down in that great luxurious city with that most scorching curse in his own breast a proud heart gnawed by poverty but your wife garcias demanded i after listening to his history your wife what has become of her she is an angel in heaven replied he abruptly at the same time turning away his head monsieur de l'orme he added more firmly do not let us speak of her it unmans me you have seen a fair flower growing in the fields have you not well you have plucked it and putting it in your bonnet have borne it in the midday sun and the evening chill and when you have looked for the flower at nightfall you have found but a withered formless beautiless thing that perforce you have given back to the earth from which it sprang say no more say no more thus she passed away since we had parted misfortunes had bent the proud spirit of the spaniard while my own had gained more energy and power so that now it was i who exercised over him the influence he had formerly possessed over me the aid he had refused from m de retz from me he was willing to accept and explaining to him my situation i easily prevailed upon him to join himself to my fortunes and to aid me in disciplining and commanding the very doubtful corps i had levied upon pretence of wishing him nearer to me i would not leave him till i had installed him in my lodgings in the rue des prêtres and there i took care that he should be supplied with everything that was externally necessary to his comfort and that his mind should be continually employed i now added six trusty servants to my retinue provided horses and arms for the whole party and my business in paris being nearly concluded prepared to return to sedan without loss of time when one morning a note was left at my little lodging desiring my presence at the palais cardinal the next evening at four o'clock and signed richelieu i instantly sent off my six servants to meaux keeping with me combelet de carignan his companion jacques moncoeur garcias and achilles with the full intention of bidding adieu to paris the next morning and putting as many leagues as possible between myself and his eminence of richelieu before the hour he had named time was when i should have waited his leisure with the palpitating heart of hope and now i prepared to gallop away from him with somewhat more speed than dignity the tempora mutantur et nos mutamur goes but a little way to tell the marvels that a month can do my plans however were disarranged by very unexpected circumstances on returning to my apartments at the hotel de soissons i sat down for a moment to write when after a gentle tap the door opened and in glided the pretty embroidery girl whom on my first arrival at the house i had seen holding the silks of the countess's work she advanced and gave a note into my hands and was then retiring from the countess my pretty maid demanded i no sir she replied pray do not tell the countess that i gave it to you and so saying she glided out of the chamber faster than she had come i opened the note immediately seeing that there was some mystery in the business and with a tumult of feelings varying at every word like the light clouds driven across an autumn sky now all sunshine now all shadow i read what follows monsieur le comte i have just learned from my father that by some strange error you have not yet heard of my recovery and that you have been passing the best of your days in regret for having as you imagined killed me though we are both well aware that the wound i received was given in your own defence i have been misled monsieur le comte by those who should have taught me right but i will no longer be commanded even by my father to do what is against my conscience and therefore i write you this letter to tell you that i am still in life so conscious was i from the first that i had received my wound as a punishment from heaven for that which i was engaged in 
that on recovering my senses at the chateau i attributed my situation to the accidental discharge of my own gun all i can add is that i always loved you and would have served you with all my heart had not other people put passions and wishes into my head that i ought never to have entertained from all that my eyes are now cleared and as proof of it i give you the following information that if you will this evening at eight o'clock when it is beginning to grow dusk go sufficiently attended to the first carrefour on the road to vincennes you will have the means of saving her you love best from much fear and uncomfort even should you be late be under no dread that she will meet with any serious evil on that score depend upon jean baptiste arnaud p s the carriage in which they convey her is red with a black boot on each side i sprang up from the table like ixion unbound from his wheel the load was off my bosom i no longer felt the curse of cain upon me my heart beat with a lightness such as we know in boyhood and the gay blood running along my veins seemed to have lost the curdling poison that had so long mingled with it it was then i first fully knew how heavily how dreadfully the burden of crime had sat upon me even when my immediate thoughts were turned to other things i felt that it had made me old before my time daring reckless hopeless but now i seemed to have regained the youngness the freshness of my spirit and hope once more lighted her torch and ran on before to illumine my path through the years to come in the first tumult of my feelings reflection upon all the collateral circumstances was out of the question but upon consideration i saw painfully how strange my absence must have appeared to my family from jean baptiste having concealed that i was the person who wounded him doubtless i thought he had told his father who had thereupon instantly taken helen from the chateau and thus my mother had been led to connect my absence with her removal several parts of jean baptiste's letter surprised me much of course however i put my own interpretation upon them and then bent my thoughts upon the danger which as he informed me menaced my dear helen what its nature could be i could not divine but without wasting time in endeavouring to discover that on which i had no means of reasoning i proceeded as fast as possible to the lodgings where i had left garcias and sending achilles for combalet and his companion prepared to set out to the place which the letter had indicated it was by this time wearing towards evening but we had still a full hour between us and the time appointed my impatience however would not brook the delay and therefore as soon as i had collected all my attendants i set off at full speed and arrived at the first carrefour on the road to vincennes about half past seven o'clock it was still quite light and a great many of the evening strollers of the city and its environs were passing to and fro so that the sight of a gentleman in mourning with four somewhat conspicuous attendants planted in the middle of a crossroad did not escape without remark one by one however the observers passed away each leaving a longer and a longer interval between himself and his successor while daylight also gradually diminished and it became dark enough to conceal us from any but very watchful eyes in the meanwhile my imagination went throughout all the various evolutions that an impatient spirit can impose upon it at one time fancying that i had mistaken the spot at another supposing that i had been purposely deceived and at another believing that the carriage which contained helen had taken a different road at length however the creaking of wheels seemed to announce its approach and drawing back as far as we could from observation we waited till it came up at about twenty paces in advance came two horsemen one of whom as soon as he arrived at the carrefour dismounted and gave his horse to his companion while he went back and opening the door of the carriage got in i could not see his face but he was a short man not taller than my little servant achilles which was the more remarkable for the difficulty he had in reaching the high step of the carriage in a moment after i heard helen's voice exclaim i have been deceived i will go no farther let me descend or i will call for assistance she was not obliged to call however assistance was nearer than she thought 
seize the horses combalet cried i and rushing forward i tore open the door of the carriage exclaiming it is i helen it is louis who has dared to deceive you she sprang out at once into my arms while the man who had entered the carriage just before made his escape at the other side swords by this time were drawn and flashing about our heads for some men who had accompanied the vehicle made a momentary show of resistance but they were soon in full flight and we remained masters of the field without any bloodshed whom i had delivered her from what i had done i knew no more than the child unborn but she clung to me with that dear confiding clasp in which woman's very helplessness is strong and repeated over and over her thanks with those words with that tone which assured me that every feeling of her heart was still mine tell me tell me dear louis said she at length by what happy chance you came here to deliver me it was by a note from jean baptiste replied i but dearest helen explain to me all this for i am still in the dark i know not whom i have delivered you from i know not what danger assailed you helen now between the confusion of the moment and the supposition that i knew a thousand circumstances of which i had not the slightest idea began a long detail which was totally unintelligible to me she spoke of having been at the hotel de chatillon waiting the return of her father from peronne and went on to say that a forged letter had been sent her signed with his name importing that a carriage and attendants would come for her at a certain hour to bring her to where he was and so perfectly imitated was his signature she said that not only herself but the countess de chatillon had also been deceived she was in the act of adding a great many particulars which completely set my comprehension at defiance when a party of horsemen galloping like madmen arrived on the spot interrupted her father narration here they are here they are cried the foremost horseman seeing through the semi-darkness the lumbering machine which had brought helen thither blocking up the road here is the carriage cut down the villains hold hold exclaimed i drawing my sword and advancing before helen while my sturdy retainers prepared for instant warfare hold fair sir a moment words before blows if you please who are you and what do you seek mon bleu cut them down cried the young man aiming a blow at my head which i parried and returned with such interest that i believe he would not have struck many more had not a less hasty personage ridden up crying hold hold shall i command you sir stranger hear me you ask our name and what we seek he added seeing me pause my name is the Maréchal de chatillon and now sir tell me yours and how you dare by false pretences to carry off a young lady from my house placed under my care by her father my name sir replied i is louis count de Long, and in reply to your second question far from having carried off this young lady from your house i have just had the pleasure of rescuing her from the hands of those who did which you would have heard before if this hasty person had been willing to listen rather than bully he is sir as you have said far over hasty replied the marechal but begging your forgiveness for his mistake i have only farther to thank you on the part of the lady for the service you have rendered her and to request that you would give her into my hands as the only person qualified to protect her for the moment i must first be satisfied that you are really the marechal de chatillon and that the lady goes with you willingly replied i for there have been so many mistakes to-night apparently that i do not otherwise yield her till i have seen her in safety myself yes yes louis replied helen i thought with a sigh it is monsieur de chatillon and i must go with him after once more giving you a thousand thanks for my deliverance since such is the case monsieur de chatillon i rejoined i of course resign a charge which otherwise i should not easily have abandoned but i must claim the privilege as one of this lady's earliest friends of visiting her to-morrow morning to hear those particulars which i have not been able to hear to-night i cannot object to such an arrangement replied the marechal alighting while his more impetuous companion made his horse's feet clatter with a touch of the spur i cannot object to such a meeting always understood that the countess of chatillon be present 
the carriage in which the rogues carried you off my fair helen added he taking her hand from mine with much gentlemanlike frankness shall serve to carry you back again and i will be your companion helen now took leave of me with more tenderness than at least the younger horseman liked for he turned his beast's head and rode a little away the maréchal then handed her into the carriage and turning to me he said in a low voice your visit monsieur le comte de l'orme if it must be had better be early for this young lady is about to undertake a long journey by desire of her father but if you would follow my advice you would instead of visiting her at all turn your horse's head from paris as speedily as possible for believe me neither your journeys to sedan nor your proceedings in this capital have been so secret as to escape suspicion he paused for a moment after having spoken as if he waited an answer or watched the effect of what he had said it came upon me i will own as if some one had struck me but i had presence of mind enough to reply my proceedings in this city senor have certainly been sufficiently open and consequently should pass without suspicion if the actions of any one be suffered to do so my journey to sedan was open enough also but my return from that place was as much so and therefore i suppose i have nothing to fear on that score my warning sir was given as a friend replied the maréchal de chatillon and i would rather meet you a few days hence in the battlefield as a fair enemy than hear that you had been consigned to the dungeons of the bastille or executed in the place de greve adieu monsieur de l'orme make the best of my warning for it is not one to be neglected thus speaking he entered the carriage and one of his followers who had dismounted shut the door and took the place of the driver who had fled at the sight of drawn swords then turning the horses towards paris he drove on followed by the train of the maréchal de chatillon in the meantime the warning i had received sunk deep into my mind and though i resolved to risk everything rather than quit paris without coming to a full explanation with helen and satisfying myself concerning a thousand doubts that hung upon me i dispatched garcias with jacques moqueur to meaux that very night with the necessary letters of exchange to pay the troop that waited me at marigny and an order for them to obey him as myself in case of my arrest or death begging him at the same time in either event to lead them to sedan and head them in the cause of the count de soissons combalet and achilles i took with me to the hotel de soissons but kept them there only for a moment while i gathered together all my papers and effects after which i gave the whole package into the hands of achilles and sending both out of the town with their own two horses and a led one for me i bade them wait for me at the village of bondy till dusk the following night if i came not then they had orders to join garcias at meaux and tell him that i was arrested all these precautions taken i went to bed and slept End of chapter forty five chapter forty six of de Lorme by g p r james the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter forty six it was barely light the next morning when i was startled by hearing some one in my sleeping chamber and to my still greater surprise perceived a woman the haughtiness and reserve with which the countess de soissons had thought fit to treat me had restrained all communication between us during my residence in her dwelling to the mere observance of a few ceremonious forms and therefore it seemed strange that she should either visit me herself at such an hour or even send any of her attendants the person who not seeing i was awake approached quickly towards me was no other however than the pretty little embroidery girl who had brought me the billet from jean baptiste the day before monsieur de l'orme monsieur de l'orme cried she in a low but anxious voice for god's sake rise the exempts are here to take you to the bastille i will run round and open that door come through it as quick as you can and you can escape yet my brother and jean baptiste will keep them as long as possible 
the door to which she pointed was one that communicated with a different part of the house and had been locked externally ever since i had tenanted those apartments she now ran round to open it taking care as i heard to fasten all the doors of my suite of rooms as she went so that i remained locked in on all sides i lost no time however in my toilet and was just dressed when she opened the door on the other side while at the same time i could distinguish the noise of persons wrenching open the door of the farther ante-room three more locks still stood between me and my pursuers but without pausing on that account i followed my pretty guide through several chambers and passages till descending a staircase we entered the garden and gliding behind a tall yew hedge which masked the garden wall we made our way straight to the tower of catherine de medici they will search here certainly said i pausing when i saw she intended to lead me into the tower as soon as they find i have quitted my apartments they will naturally examine this place of retreat hush cried she you do not know all its contrivances monsieur opening the door she permitted me to enter and following locked it on the inside we now climbed the spiral staircase up to the very highest part of the tower and emerged on the stone platform at the top exactly opposite to the mouth of the staircase which we had ascended she pointed out to me one of the large flagstones with which the observatory was paved saying you are a strong man you can lift that i knelt down and getting my fingers underneath the edge easily raised it up when i beheld another staircase precisely similar to that which we had ascended and which passing round and round the tower exactly followed all the spires of the other thus forming a double staircase through the whole building my pretty companion now tried whether she could herself move the stone and finding that she could do so with ease as it was scarcely thicker than a slate she followed me down and drew it in the manner of a trap-door over us the whole reminded me so much of my flight with the unhappy viceroy of catalonia that i hurried my steps as much as possible with the remembrance vivid before my mind's eye of the dreadful scene with which that flight was terminated we are safe now monsieur said my fair guide with a naivete which some men might have mistaken for coquetry by your leave we will not go so fast for i lose my breath if we are safe then my pretty preserver replied i taking a jewel from my finger which i had bought a few days before for a different purpose i have time to thank you for your activity in saving me and to beg your acceptance of this ring as a remembrance i will not take it myself my lord replied she but with your leave i will give it to jean baptiste who has a great regard for you and who sent me to show you the way as i know all the secret places of the hotel and neither my brother nor he are acquainted with them and i suppose that jean baptiste then is to be looked on in the light of your lover fair lady demanded i he is a friend of my brother the countess's page replied the girl and then added after a moment and perhaps a lover too i do not see why i should deny it he slept here last night with my brother to be out of the way of some evil that was going on and they too lying in the gatehouse first discovered that they were exempts who knocked at the gate so early and what they wanted will you bear a message to jean baptiste said i tell him that i am not ungrateful for his kindness and bid him tell his sister that nothing but that which has this day happened would have prevented me from seeing her as i promised his sister said the girl i did not know that he had a sister but hark they are searching the tower as she spoke i could plainly hear the sound of steps treading the other staircase and passing directly over our heads and curious was the sensation to feel myself within arm's length of my pursuers without the possibility of their overtaking me they have broken open the door said my companion in a low tone we had better make haste for when they do not find you in the tower they may set guards in the streets round about we were by this time near the bottom of the stairs 
and the light which had hitherto shone in through various small apertures in the masonry of the tower now left us as we descended apparently below the level of the ground my pretty little guide however seemed to hold herself quite safe with me though the situation was one which might have been hazardous with many men and led me on without seeming to give a thought to anything but securing my safety till we had passed through a long passage at the end of which she pushed open a door and at once ushered me into a small chamber wherein an old woman was in bed startled out of a sound sleep the good dame sat up demanding who was there tis i aunt tis i replied the girl where is my uncle's cloak oh here wrap yourself in that monsieur and take this old hat and no one will know you i will tell you all about it aunt she added in answer to a complete hurricane of questions which the old woman poured forth upon her i will tell you about it when the count is safe in the street is it the count lord bless us cried the old woman wiping her eyes and mistaking me for the count de soissons dear me i thought monsieur was safe in sedan my fair guide now beckoning me forward i left the old lady to enjoy her own wonderment and leaving a piece of gold for the hat and cloak thrust the one over my brows and cast the other round my shoulders and proceeded to a second chamber where was an old man at work who looked up but asked no questions though probably he saw his own cloak and hat on the person of a stranger opposite to me stood an open door evidently leading into a small street and taking leave of my conductress merely by a mute sign i passed out and to my surprise found myself in the rue du four i had kept my own hat still under the mantle which was in truth somewhat too small to cover me entirely the point of my sword my boots and almost my knees appearing from underneath and betraying a very different station in life from that which the cloak itself bespoke however as thousands of intrigues of every kind are every day adjourned by the first rays of sun that shine upon paris and as the parties to them must often be obliged to conceal themselves in many a motley disguise i calculated that mine would not attract much attention dangerous to myself if i could but escape from the immediate vicinity of the hotel de soissons i therefore walked straight down the rue du four and passing before the new church of saint eustache i gained the rue montmartre and thence crossing the boulevards was soon in the country pausing under an old elm the emblematic tree of my family i cast off the cloak and hat i had assumed judging that i was now beyond the likelihood of pursuit and walked as fast as possible towards bondy i arrived there in about a couple of hours and found achilles sauntering tranquilly before the door while combalet swaggered within to the new risen host hostess and servants of the little inn neither of my attendants expecting me for many an hour to come my order to horse was soon obeyed and before midday i was safe at meaux where i gave but a temporary rest to my horses and being joined by garcias and the rest of my suite i set out again with all speed towards mouzon the necessity of borrowing another person's name was in those days so frequent with every one that on my announcing myself to my servants as the young baron de chatillon the nephew of the maréchal of that name i caused no astonishment and they habituated themselves to the new epithet with great facility riding on before with garcias i now explained to him all that had occurred which i had not had time to do before my first piece of news that jean baptiste arnaud was in existence surprised him as much as it had done myself i would have vowed said he that what i saw before me when i joined you on that morning in the park was nothing but a heap of earth which would never move nor breathe nor think again it is very extraordinary and now i think of it monsieur de lorme i am afraid that i did you some unnecessary harm in the opinion of the chevalier de montenero do you remember that day when we saved him from the fury of gil moreno well as i was hurrying him away to his horse i told him that his life itself depended on his speed to which he answered 
I would give life itself to be assured whether Louis de Bigorre did slay him or not, alluding to something he had been speaking of with you. I thought, as you did, that this Jean-Baptiste was really dead, and therefore I replied at once, Slay him? To be sure he did, and did right, too. Good God, Garcias, cried I. He was speaking of another event, of the priest at Saragossa, whose death I had no more hand in than you had. I know not how it is, but often in life, one accidental mistake or misunderstanding appears to bring on another to all eternity. There seems occasionally to be something confounding and entangling in the very essence of the circumstances in which we are placed, which communicates itself to everything connected with them, and with one help or another they go on through a long chain of errors from the beginning to the end. My vexation was evident enough to mortify Garcias deeply, without my saying any more. And therefore, when he had told me that the Chevalier, on receiving the news he gave him, had instantly sprung into the saddle and ridden away in silence, I dropped a subject on which I felt that I could not speak without irritation, and turned to the coming events. We continued our journey as rapidly as possible, and my non de guerre, I found, served me well at all the various places of our halt, as I heard continually that troops were marching in all directions towards the frontier, evidently menacing Sedan, together with every particular that could be communicated to me, respecting their line of march, their numbers, and condition, for all of which information I was indebted to my assumed name of Chatillon, the Maréchal de Chatillon himself being appointed commander-in-chief of the king's army, or rather, I might say, the minister's, for the monarch was calmly waiting the event of the approaching contest at Peron, without showing that interest in favour of the cardinal which he had hitherto evinced on all occasions we passed safe and uninterrupted across the whole country from paris till we came within a few leagues of the bank of the meurs where the presence of the enemy's army rendered our movements more hazardous and consequently more circumspect from time to time we met several parties of stragglers hastening after the camp with some of whom i spoke for a moment or two and finding that no suspicions were entertained and discipline somewhat relaxed i ventured more boldly to the meurs and presented myself for passage at the wooden bridge over mouzon after ascertaining that it was but slightly guarded notice had been given to all my followers in case of the slightest opposition to our passage to draw their swords and force their way across and accordingly on the cravat on duty demanding a passport i said i would show it him and drawing my sword bade him give way he did his duty by instantly firing his carbine at me which had nearly brought my adventures to a termination for the ball passed through my hat but spurring on our horses we bore him back upon half a dozen others who came running forward to his aid drove them over the bridge at the sword's point and galloping on gained the wood on the other side of the river after this rencontre we made all speed through the least frequented paths towards marigny and when we found ourselves within half a league of the village i sent forward jacques moncoeur and achilles to ascertain what had become of my recruits whom i found i had posted somewhat too near the enemy's position in about an hour they returned bringing with them a single trooper who was without a cask of any kind and wore a peasant's coat over his more warlike habiliments in addition to all this he had apparently taken as much care of his inward man as his outward for he was considerably more than half drunk happy for this sweet youth said achilles who as may have been observed was fond of displaying his antique learning happy for this sweet youth that we are not amongst the epizephery or he would certainly have been hanged for drinking more wine than the physicians recommended but we have drawn from him monsieur that his companions judging themselves somewhat too near the enemy have betaken themselves to the nearest branch of the forest of ardennes hard by the village of sole where they are even now celebrating their elephabolia or venison feasts having left this bacchus worshipper to tell us the way though our horses were weary we could of course grant them no rest 
till they had carried us over the six leagues that still lay between us and Seoul, which, after many misdirections, we at last found, a little village cradled in the giant arms of the Ardennes. My heart somewhat misgave me, lest my respectable recruits should have exercised any of their old plundering propensities upon the peasantry, and the appearance and demeanour of the comrade they had left behind to acquaint us with their change of position did not speak much in favour of their regularity and discipline but i did them an injustice and on my arrival though i found that they had laid many of the antlered people of the forest low and eke added many a magnificent forest hog to their stores of provision they had not at all molested the populace of the country who remembering the ravages of mansfeldt's free companions looked upon my followers as very sober and peaceable soldiers indeed when i arrived they were in a large piece of open forest ground between the village and the actual wood a great many old oaks had been cut down there the year before and their roots had sent out a multitude of young shoots among which the daring hardy men i had engaged had gathered themselves together in picturesque groups roasting the venison for their evening meal or ella Fabolia, as achilles termed it in the meanwhile the declining sun shone through the long glades of the forest sometimes catching bright upon their corslets and morion sometimes casting upon them a deep shadow from any of the ancient trees that remained still standing but altogether giving one of the finest and most extraordinary pieces of light and shade that i ever beheld the noise of our horses feet made them instantly start up from their various employments and recognizing me for their commander they hailed my arrival with a loud shout they were all as i soon found old soldiers and well aware of the infinite use of discipline even to themselves they had employed the time of my absence in choosing petty officers from amongst their own body and in renewing their old military habits and manoeuvres the system which they had employed was not perhaps entirely that which my late military readings had taught me theoretically but as i saw it would cause me infinitely less trouble to adopt their plan than it would give them to acquire mine as well as be less liable to mistakes i applied myself to reviewing and manoeuvring them the whole of the next day while i sent achilles and one of my servants to sudan charged with my bills of exchange for paying my levies and with a letter to the count de soissons informing him of my success i felt assured that all the news i conveyed to him would give the count no small pleasure not only having fulfilled all his wishes in paris but brought him a reinforcement of nearly three hundred mounted troops all veterans in affairs of war from their ancient profession and accumulated in every point of stratagem from their more recent pursuits in the evening achilles returned bringing me the money i required and a letter from the prince together with a reinforcement of twelve troopers whom the count judged might prove serviceable to me in disciplining my little force the letter was as gratifying as ever flowed from the pen of man and the money which i instantly distributed amongst my followers conjoined with the presence of the men-at-arms the count had sent me contributed to establish my authority with my recruits as firmly as i could wish though i believe that before this came they were beginning to grumble at the somewhat childish reiteration with which i took pleasure in making my new troop go through its evolutions at the time i found plentiful excuses in my own mind for so doing but i believe now that my feelings were somewhat like those of a boy with a new plaything the next morning according to the commands of the count i recrossed the meurs by a bridge of boats which the duc de bouillon had newly caused to be constructed and then marched my men upon a little hamlet behind the village of torcy after which i left them under the command of garcias as my adjutant and accompanied by my servants turned my bridle towards sedan to communicate with the prince and receive his father commands i arrived at sedan about five of the clock all within the town was the bustle and confusion of military preparation trumpets were sounding arms were clanging in every direction the breastplate the morion and the spur had taken the place in the streets 
of the citizen's sober gown and the man of law's stiff cap and many an accoutred war-horse did i encounter in my way to the citadel more than sedan had ever known before the servants that accompanied me including achilles combalet and his companion were nine in number and i had taken good care before i left paris that they should be sufficiently armed to take an active part in the warlike doings then in preparation my train therefore as i rode through the streets excited some attention and amongst a knot of gentlemen that turned to look near the citadel i perceived to my surprise the marquis de saint brie it may well be supposed that the sight was not particularly gratifying and i was passing on without taking any notice hoping that he would not recollect me from the great change which the few months that had passed had wrought in my appearance my beard which when i had last seen him had been too short to be allowed to grow was now longer and cut into the fashionable point of that day my mustachios were long and black my form was broader and more manly and my skin which then was pale with recent illness was now bronzed almost to the colour of mahogany but he was not one of those men who easily forget and after looking at me for a moment during which the change somewhat confused him he became certain of my person and spurring forward with a smiling countenance in which delight to meet with an old friend was most happily and dexterously expressed my dear count louis cried he i am delighted to see you this is one of those unexpected pleasures with which that fair jilt fortune sometimes treats us to make us bear more patiently her less agreeable caprices i meditated knocking his brains out but i forbore on reflecting that the consequences of any violent proceeding on my part might be highly detrimental to the interest of the prince a moment's farther consideration made me pursue the very opposite course to that which i had first proposed and smothering my feelings towards m de saint brie as far as i could i replied that the meeting was certainly most unexpected but that as i found him there of course i supposed i was to look upon him as a friend and partisan of m le comte's of course replied he i am his highness's humble friend and devoted follower though i have yet hardly the honour of his personal acquaintance being far better known to the noble duke of bouillon however here i am to fight side by side with you my dear count as i once proposed and we will see which will contrive to get his throat cut soonest in the prince's service it will certainly not be i replied i gravely for wherever the battle takes place however i may exert myself therein i shall come out of it as unscathed as i went in indeed how so demanded the marquis do you wear a charmed coat of mail or have you been dipped in sticks neither replied i but it is my fate in the calculation of my nativity it has been found that whoever seeks to take my life their own shall be lost in the attempt two persons have made the essay and two have already fallen we shall see who will be the third what i said was simply intended to touch the marquis upon a spot where i knew he must be sensible but the excessive paleness that came over his countenance was far more than i expected to behold it was more than i could suppose the mere fear of having been discovered would excite in a man of such principles could he be superstitious i asked myself he a free thinker a sceptic both by an erroneous application of his reason and by the natural propensity of a sensualist to reject everything but what is material could he be superstitious but so in fact it was as i soon found more clearly by the multitude of questions which he asked me concerning the person who had calculated my nativity and given the prediction i have mentioned citing as he did so the names of all the astrologers in europe from nostradamus up to vanoni himself after a moment however he seemed to be conscious that he was exposing himself and looking up with a forced laugh dreams dreams said he my dear count how can the stars affect us upon the earth 
if i were to choose a way of fooling myself with prophecies a thousand times rather would i follow the art of the ancient tuscans and draw my divination from the lightning which at all events comes near our mortal habitation i know you are a sceptic in all such matters replied i and riding on i left the marquis to muse over the prediction as he thought fit reserving to myself the right of calling him to a personal account for his former conduct towards me when i should find a fitting opportunity his character was then a new one to me and i could hardly persuade myself that he did really believe in the dreams which even my reason all hag risen as it was by imagination cast from it the moment it had power to follow its direct course but i have had occasion to remark since that those who reject the truth of religion are generally as prone as devotees to the dreams of superstition i was immediately admitted into the citadel and as i was dismounting in the court encountered Baricaville. welcome welcome back monsieur de l'orme said he we need all friends now to carry through our enterprise and monsieur le comte tells me that you not only bring us good news from paris but a considerable reinforcement you come from torcy what is the news there did you see the enemy when are we likely to prove our strength together i come to seek news myself replied i no enemies have i seen but half a dozen soldiers that we drove over the wooden bridge near mouzon when does rumour say we shall have a battle the day after to-morrow at farthest replied Varicaville, if lamboy with his germans arrives in time but hie to the prince de l'orme he expects you and is now waiting you in the saloon hoping some news from torcy i proceeded to the count's apartments accordingly and finding no one to announce me by the way i entered the saloon at once the count de soissons was leaning in a large armchair with his head bent forward and one hand over his eyes while vanbroc his flemish lute-player was playing to him the prelude of a song my entrance did not make the prince look up and von brock proceeded after a few very sweet passages preliminary to his voice he sung as nearly as i can remember the following to a beautiful minor air one give me repose and peace let others prove the losing game of strife or climb the hill or plough the wave to find out fortune or a grave stake happiness and life oh give me rest and peace and quietude and love two give me repose and peace the power the sway the sceptre crown and throne our thorny treasures paying ill the sacrifice of joy and will all man can call his own oh give me rest and peace to bless my humble day three give me repose and peace i covet not the laurel or the wreath wars to the brave strifes to the strong ambitions to the proud belong all hand in hand with death but be repose and peace and life and joy my lot the musician ceased but still the prince kept his hand before his eyes and i could see the tears roll slowly from underneath it and chase one another down his cheek so great had been the power of the music upon him no more van brock no more said he at length raising his eyes ha de l'orme you should not have seen me thus but i was ever more easily vanquished by music than by the sword but now to business leave us van brock the lute player withdrew and the prince instantly recovering from the momentary weakness into which he had been betrayed proceeded to question me respecting the minor details of my negotiation in paris with all that i had done he expressed himself infinitely contented and showed the confidence which my conduct had inspired him with by making me acquainted with every particular that had taken place at sedan during my absence together with all future plans as far as they were formed to-morrow evening said he or the next morning at farthest lamboy the imperial general will join us with five thousand veteran germans as soon as he is prepared to pass the river i also shall cross by the bridge and forming our junction on the other side 
we will together offer battle to the Maréchal de Châtillon, who has been for some days at Remilly. "'I believe your highness is misinformed,' replied I, "'for hardly yet five days ago I saw Monsieur de Châtillon in Paris.' And I proceeded to inform the Count of the circumstances which made me so positive of the fact. "'He was there last night, however,' replied the Count, "'for one of our scouts watched him pass the Meurs "'and advance some way to reconnoitre Lamboy. "'His person was known, and there could be no doubt. "'At all events, we shall fairly offer our enemy battle "'on the day after to-morrow. "'Lamboy commands the infantry, Bouillon the cavalry, "'and myself the reserve. "'But what makes you look so grave "'on my saying that Bouillon commands the cavalry?' "'My reason was frankly this, monsieur,' replied I. "'Monsieur de Bouillon has never shown any great regard for me, "'and I have farther this day met a person on whose conduct towards me "'I have already expressed myself to your highness without restraint. "'I mean the Marquis de Saint-Brie.' "'The Count started. "'He boasts himself the friend of Monsieur de Bouillon,' continued I, "'and you may easily imagine what sort of harmony there can exist between him and me.' The little troop I have levied, consisting entirely of cavalry, it will not, of course, be very pleasant to me to fight side by side with a man who has twice attempted my life. But, however, stay, Delorme, said the Count. No likelihood exists of that taking place which you anticipate. Your troop has been destined by Bouillon and myself for a manoeuvre, which we are sure you will execute well, and on which the fate of the battle may probably depend. If we can gain the ground that we wish, the cavalry under the command of Bouillon will remain in the hollow way till such time as the enemy lose somewhat of their compact order. As soon as ever this is ascertained, by a signal from the hill behind, where you may have remarked an ancient pillar, the signal, remember, is the raising of a red flag on the pillar, Bouillon advances and charges the cavalry of the enemy but some cooperating movement may be necessary to second the efforts of the duke and consequently we have determined to post a body of cavalry behind a little wood to the left of our position you must have seen it but you shall be furnished with a plan of the country like this on the table here you see is the great wood of the marfay here the little wood to the left joined to the marfay by this low copse which i shall take care to garnish for you with a body of musketeers here the high summit on which if we have time to reach it we shall take up our position and here the hollow way for bouillon's cavalry your body of troopers must be stationed just behind the wood from whence you have a full view of the pillar the moment you see the red flag draw out and charge the right of the enemy you have before you a gentle slope which is in truth the only part of the ground fit for cavalry and your being there will have two great advantages that of seconding bouillon and in case of the enemy attempting to turn our left flank that of making his manoeuvre fall upon himself it was for this reason that i ordered your troop on to the hamlet behind torcy from whence on the morning of the battle you can easily take up your position as we have arranged do you fully understand perfectly replied i and the arrangement is of course most gratifying to me not that any circumstances should have induced me to pursue a private quarrel to the detriment of your highness's service i have already met the marquis de saint brie and spoken to him without noticing his attempt upon my life you did right de lorme replied the count his brow knitting into a sterner frown than i had ever seen him assume but if he has the insolence to present himself before me my conduct must be very different in addition to this attempt upon you he is known to have been the murderer of the count de bagnole and strongly suspected of having poisoned poor de valencay my own honour and dignity require me to have no communion with such a man let his rank and influence be what it may if i can meet with bouillon we will make such arrangements as will spare me the mortification of publicly repelling this bad man come with me we will see if we can find him so saying he took his hat which lay upon the table and passed into the ante-room several of his attendants were now in waiting and rising followed with me into the court 
and thence into the great square before the chateau it was a fine sunny evening in july one of those that seem made for loitering in the shade with some pleasant companion listening to dreamy fanciful talk and drinking the balmy breath of the summer air as our misfortune would have it however the first person we encountered thus employed was the marquis de st brie himself who had by this time dismounted and surrounded by a crowd of the most distinguished persons at sedan was entertaining them with that easy flowing conversation which no one knew so well how to display as himself i could tell by the countenances of the listeners and the smile that sat upon the lip of each the very tone of what was passing and i could almost fancy i heard it all the tart jest the pointed sneer the amusing anecdote the shrewd remark the witty turn all softened and harmonized by the language which made the company of that infamous man so fascinating and so dangerous the prince who knew him by sight was passing on the other side of the square where the duke of bouillon was himself inspecting a body of infantry but the party of gentlemen instantly advanced towards us and one of them coming a step forward begged leave to make the marquis de st brie known to his highness the count de soissons sir replied the count looking back tossing back the plumes of his bonnet as if to let every one see that he did not make the least inclination to the person thus presented to him thank god i know the marquis de st brie thoroughly and seek to know no more of him and thus speaking he turned his back upon the marquis and walked forward to the duke of bouillon to whom he explained in a few words his feelings in regard to the other without however at all implicating my name in the business few people can look upon him with less respect than i do said the duke of bouillon in reply but he is a man of great wealth and influence and though he is here at present with only a few servants which i will own strikes me as singular he promises me a reinforcement of five hundred men in three days which may be very serviceable for the purpose of improving our victory the day after to-morrow your highness must really allow me to explain away your treatment of him in some degree for he is too influential a person to be lost the count would hardly hear of any qualificatory measure but after a long discussion he gave way in some degree well well said he say to him what you like but do not let him come near me for i cannot receive him with civility i will take care that he be kept away replied the duke the only difficulty will be to make him remain with us at all we now returned to the citadel and the rest of the evening passed in all the bustle and activity of preparation the service which i was to execute was again and again pointed out to me both by the prince and the duke of bouillon the last of whom probably to animate me to still greater exertion gave unlimited praise to all the arrangements i had hitherto made and expressed the most confidence in my cooperation with himself in the battle that was likely to take place looking on my troop as perfectly secure under the command of garcias i remained at sedan that night spending the rest of my time after i had left the princes in fitting myself with the necessary defensive armour which i had not been able to procure in paris this was not done without some difficulty even at sedan for the armourers had quite sufficient occupation with the multitude of warlike guests that filled the city when this was accomplished however and i possessed my morion back and breast pieces taslets and gauntlets complete i sat down to write a letter to be delivered to my father in case of my death in the ensuing battle and gave full instructions concerning it to little achilles whom i intended to leave at sedan after this i paused for a moment in the open window of my chamber watching some thick clouds that came rolling over the moon and thinking of the strange strong effect of imagination which i had there myself experienced together with the extraordinary coincidence of my mother's death being announced to me so soon afterwards as i stood i heard a window below me open and some voices speaking what they said at first was indistinct from the noise of a tumbrel rolling across the court 
but that ceased and i could plainly distinguish the tone of the marquis de saint brie saying i tell you i saw him myself with the marquis de sourdi in the other army if it was not he it was his spirit he was paler thinner darker older but there was every line and yet surely it could not be no no my lord replied another voice i saw him as dead as a felled ox and i gave him myself another slash across the head to make all sure before i threw him into the water i will trust my own hand next time however said the marquis not that i doubt you my good as he spoke i remembered that i was eavesdropping and though if ever there was an occasion when it might be justified it was then i felt ashamed to do so and retired to my bed bidding my servants however lock the door of the ante-room before they slept End of chapter 46